Hello everybody, welcome back to ATM5, Our Changing Atmosphere. In today's lecture, we're going to go back and talk more about aerosols. From our lecture last time on climate change, it's clear that aerosols are very important to the Earth's system, but I expect there may be some confusion on what exactly they are and where they come from. In this lecture, we're going to define aerosols, smog, and PM2.5. The questions we're going to address are, what are the different kinds of aerosols and their sources? What is the role of aerosols in the Earth's atmosphere? And how do aerosols in the atmosphere affect climate change? By definition, aerosols are minute particles suspended in the atmosphere, typically kept aloft because of their small size. These particles are much larger than individual gas molecules and so behave differently than these gases when they interact with radiation. The presence of these aerosols is apparent because of their ability to scatter and absorb light. High concentrations of aerosol are responsible for haze, which can reduce overall visibility. The scattering of red light by these aerosols can also redden sunrises and sunsets. You may be most familiar with aerosols in the context of aerosol sprays, such as deodorizing sprays, canned starch, asthma inhalers, or spray paint. The valve on these cans are designed to create an aerosol mist out of liquid particles. The resulting mist then consists of these suspended aerosols. There are many types of aerosols, including volcanic ash, pollen, sea salt, and soot, each shown here under a scanning electron microscope image. These particles have a variety of shapes ranging from relatively spherical to jagged and sharp. In addition to anthropogenically produced aerosols, aerosols also naturally arise from many natural sources, including desert dust from vegetation, smoke, volcanoes, and sea spray. To learn more about aerosols, you can follow the link at the bottom of this slide. Besides being responsible for ruining views, high aerosol loads are also associated with negative consequences for human health. In this image, we see the city of Pittsburgh on two days as viewed from the same location. The left image shows the city under a relatively high aerosol load of 45 micrograms per cubic meter. The right image shows the city under a much lower load of 4 micrograms per cubic meter. These smog decks are normally formed because of stagnant air that is not well circulated, plus emissions from natural or anthropogenic sources. Smog itself is composed of the words smoke and fog, and refers to a haze layer typically consisting of atmospheric pollutants and aerosols. Beijing is well known as a global hotspot for poor air quality related to high aerosol concentrations, particularly over the fall and winter. When cold, stagnant air settles beneath warmer air, air is not able to circulate readily into the troposphere and remains near the surface. Consequently, air pollution from the city accumulates and remains trapped near the surface. A smog alert can produce incredibly hazardous air quality, which greatly impacts the health of residents. Here we see the effect of air pollution on Beijing's famous Bird's Nest Stadium, with low aerosol concentrations on the left and higher concentrations on the right. Beijing has been the product of relatively, uh, of relatively unregulated economic growth over the past several decades and accompanied by substantial industrial pollutants from personal travel. Natural factors also contribute to poor pollution in the city. The city is located in a valley which prevents air from naturally circulating laterally. It is located downwind of a dry desert region and so is subject to dust storms that can bring further pollution into the region. And the aforementioned meteorological conditions, particularly during fall and winter, contribute to trapping of air near the surface. Nonetheless, more than 70% of atmospheric aerosols in the city are the product of human activity. Poor air quality is a common problem among global nations undergoing industrialization, as rapid growth coupled with weak regulations contribute to increasingly more pollution being dumped into the atmosphere. Similar hazardous air quality events are common in the Indian city of New Delhi, where trapping of air around the city contributes to an increase in local aerosol concentration. As we've experienced over the past several years in California, wildfires are a common sor source of smoke aerosol pollution. In this image, smoke is seen rising from the Sonoma wildfires on October 13, 2017. Wildfires produce two kinds of aerosols that are relevant to the climate system, organic carbon and black carbon. The relative concentration of each is dependent on the type of vegetation being burned. Wildfire smoke, when wafted into the mid to upper troposphere, can impact radiative transfer in the atmosphere. As we've touched on before, these aerosols impact absorption and scattering pro properties across wavelengths and can drive the occurrence of orange or red skies. In general, aerosols preferentially absorb shorter wavelength radiation such as blue light, leaving behind more orange or red radiation. 
If the aerosols are close to the ground, the environment feels smoky and gray. But if air the aerosol layer is aloft, with a relatively clear air layer beneath, the results are pretty visibly striking, as seen here on the right. As you're likely aware, aerosol concentration is strongly connected with air quality. Higher aerosol concentrations can cause breathing problems, particularly among sensitive groups. When breathed in, these particles can clog up the lungs and interfere with the ability of people to absorb oxygen. Particulates whose size is below 2.5 micrometers are particularly dangerous, as these are able to penetrate into tissues and the bloodstream after inhalation and cause DNA damage, potentially triggering cancer, or heart attacks and other forms of premature death. Those particulates smaller than 2.5 micrometers are given the name PM2.5, and their atmospheric concentration is often the primary feature of air quality reports. PM2.5 can come from a variety of sources, including biological contaminants, atmospheric dust, and pollution from fires or combustion. In the chart on the right, we see several examples of potential sources of PM2.5. Aerosols are typically measured using a quantity known as optical depth, which is a measure of how much aerosol we see if looking between the top of the atmosphere and the planetary surface. Using the NASA MODIS satellite, here we see the aerosol optical depth as averaged over the period 2007 to 2011. Dark brown regions correspond to thick and heavily polluted regions of the world where, aerosol, or where air is highly laden with aerosols. The developing regions along eastern China and northern India are clearly apparent here, with substantial aerosol pollution from human activity. Some of these aerosol plumes are thick enough to traverse the Pacific and make landfall in western North America. Elsewhere in the world, we see the dry deserts of the world highlighted, where dust storms naturally carry mineral dust aerosols into the atmosphere. In the more vegetated parts of the world, such as over the rainforests, we see biogenic aerosols associated with natural emissions from forests, as well as smoke rising from natural and unnatural forest fires. Finally, we see some enhancement in aerosol concentrations over parts of the ocean, where intense winds can drive enhanced sea spray and drive up atmospheric sea salt concentrations. Aerosols do play an important role in the global hydrologic cycle, as we'll emphasize further in later lectures. Aerosols provide a surface for the condensation of water vapor in the atmosphere. Thus, low concentrations of aerosols are associated with reduced condensation and cloud formation. Similarly, higher concentrations of aerosols are associated with increased concentration, and so denser clouds. Cloud and precipitation formation can be enhanced with the injection of aerosols into the atmosphere, as one can accomplish through what is known as cloud seeding. This is a technique that has been used around the world to control rainfall location and amounts. Perhaps the most well-known cloud seeding activities have occurred in China, where cloud seeding is used to increase rainfall in arid regions, and was used to prevent weather disruptions during the Beijing Olympics. Let's discuss the different types of aerosols. Mineral dust is a key aerosol species that is particularly prominent in the dry regions of the world, consisting of small grains of dust, dirt, and sand. The image here depicts wind-blown dust from a dust storm in Texas in 1935. Aerosols can come about naturally from biogenic emissions, compounds naturally released from vegetation and forests. These include long-chain hydrocarbons, tree debris, pollen, and other small organic particles. These aerosols are known as organic carbon aerosols. Another natural aerosol is sea salt, which is naturally transferred from ocean or sea surface during turbulent windstorms or via natural diffusion. Black carbon is another kind of aerosol that is a natural product of burning of vegetation or fossil fuels, particularly dirtier forms of fuel, such as coal. The dark color of this aerosol makes it highly absorptive to incoming radiation. In the atmosphere, this aerosol causes atmospheric warming as radiative energy is absorbed. When it finally settles out of the atmosphere, it can darken the resulting surface and drive down its albedo. For instance, if deposited on snow, it will result in far more radiation being absorbed by the surface and can drive acceleration in snow melt. The image on the left here is a depiction of a soot particle, one form of black carbon. Aerosols are also a significant product of volcanic eruptions. Particularly explosive volcanic eruptions can send aerosols high into the atmosphere, even into the stratosphere, where they can linger for several years. 
Both directly emitted aerosols and indirect chemical products of volcanic emissions in the stratosphere can reduce the amount of solar radiation reaching the planet's surface and drive widespread cooling. Eruptions from the past 50 years, including Pinatubo and El Chichen, have been implicated in lowering global temperatures in the months and years following the eruption. Sulfate aerosols are the primary product of volcanic eruptions, emerging as a byproduct of chemical reactions with emitted sulfur dioxide gas. However, sulfate aerosols can also emerge from anthropogenically produced sulfur dioxide, a common byproduct of coal burning and one associated with acid rain, or from dimethyl sulfide, or DMS, which is naturally produced by marine phytoplankton. Finally, nitrate aerosols are generally synthetic aerosols produced in urban areas from nitrogen oxides or in vehicle catalytic converters. The nitrogen oxide emission from vehicles will react with salt spray aerosols, with ammonia in agricultural areas, and with carbonates in arid areas to produce nitrate aerosols. Aerosols are not only important for determining air quality, but they also play an important role in the energetics of the climate system. Most aerosols are highly reflective of incoming radiation and cool the earth by reflecting sunlight back to space. Also, when these aerosols act as cloud condensation nuclei, they are responsible for driving up cloud concentrations, which act as reflective surfaces for incoming radiation. Nonetheless, dark aerosols like black carbon are highly absorptive to incoming radiation and can enhance atmospheric or surface warming. This video from NASA shows how aerosols are distributed around the globe from their respective sources. In blue, we see sea salt aerosols, which tend to have the highest concentration in turbulent regions of the ocean. In brown, we have mineral dust aerosols, which largely originate from the dry deserts of the world. Dust from the Sahara Desert can be picked up on the strong trade winds of the subtropics and carried across the Atlantic all the way to the United States. In green, we have organic aerosols, which are particularly concentrated around regions of dense vegetation, such as rainforests or the boreal forests of the world. Finally, in white, we see human emissions, whose origins are primarily from the most populated regions of the world. The global circulation carries these aerosols from their origins and transports them all over the globe. We already discussed last time about this figure from the IPCC fifth assessment report. Now that we've learned about the origins of aerosols, we can zoom in on the effect that aerosols have on global radiative forcing. In general, human influences on mineral dust, sulfate, nitrate, and organic carbon aerosols drive a cooling effect for the planet around one watt per square meter. However, our emissions of black carbon aerosols offset that effect, producing warming of slightly more than 0.5 watts per square meter. The, this direct effect of aerosols on the Earth's system's budget is relatively well known. The indirect effect of aerosols occurs because of changes in cloud amount and character, and is captured in the second line in this figure. Here we have much less certainty on the influence of aerosols, although we are confident it is a cooling effect, as aerosols are responsible for more clouds and less water vapor, there are wide error bars on this effect's magnitude. A curious consequence of the cooling effect of aerosols relates to how we have been engineering the concentrations of these particulates in the atmosphere. A focus over the past several decades on improving air quality has resulted in a reduction in anthropogenically emitted aerosols. The result has been striking, as the air quality in the U.S. today is dramatically improved over the mid-20th century. However, in reducing aerosol amounts in the atmosphere, we have also removed aerosols from the system consequently removing a major factor that offsets the warming from greenhouse gas emissions. So policies such as the Clean Air Act, which focus primarily on reducing aerosol emissions, can also have negative climate consequences if they do not also aim to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In summary, aerosols are an important component of the Earth system. Human activities have changed the concentration of these particles in the atmosphere, and in the process modified the pathways for energy in the atmosphere. Next time, we're going to be talking about ozone and how our activities have also changed the distribution of this gas in the atmosphere as well.